tonight, being rewarded. The former joint opposition parliamentarian Shriani Vijayvikrama, who joined the government, appointed as a state minister. Local government polls. Depositing bonds for the remaining 248 local bodies begins. Take action soon. The United Nations Working Group on Arbitrary Detention states that Sri Lanka should immediately implement reforms. We found that the right to personal liberty has yet to be respected by authorities. Funding approved. Sri Lanka enters into a three loan agreement worth of 270 million US dollars with the Asian Development Bank. And in international headlines, moving on, EU leaders have agreed to move Brexit talks onto the second phase. We're definitely moving to the second stage. Absolutely, definitely. A warm welcome to all our viewers across Sri Lanka and around the world. This is First at Nine, and I'm Mahesh Johnny. We begin tonight with the latest on the upcoming polls. Accepting of nominations for the upcoming local government elections in 200, 248 local government bodies is scheduled to commence next Monday. Accordingly, political parties and independent groups deposited bonds for their election candidates. Out of 341 local government bodies across the island, the notice calling for nominations was issued to 93 local government bodies on the 27th of November and submission of nominations was closed at noon yesterday. The notice calling for nominations in the remaining 248 local government bodies was issued on the 4th of this month and submission of nominations for those regions are to begin on Monday the 18th of December and will end at noon on Thursday the 21st. Deposition of bonds for candidates in the remaining local government bodies was carried out today as well. The United National Party deposited bonds for several local government bodies in the Colombo district under the patronage of State Minister Iran Vikramaratna. Minister Chandrani Bandara presided over the UNP's deposition of bonds for several local government bodies in the Anuradhapura district. No UNP nominations have been rejected as yet and they will not be. We have rallied around for a strong journey ahead. The UNP also deposited bonds for several local government bodies in the Ratnapura district under the patronage of Minister Talata Atukorala. Meanwhile, the United People's Freedom Alliance deposited bonds for the Mulleri Pradeshia Sabha and the Korte, Moratua and Kaduela Municipal Councils. <laughs> State Minister Lakshman Yapabe Vardhana presided over the UPFA's deposition of bonds for several local government bodies in the Mathara district. <laughs> Meanwhile, a ceremony was held in Navalapitiya under the patronage of UNP parliamentarian Anand Alud Gamage to welcome candidates contesting for the Navalapitiya Pradeshya Sabha. Religious rites were carried out last evening at the Polonarwagal Viharaya to invoke blessings upon candidates contesting for four local government bodies in the Polonarwa district under the patronage of UPFA MP Roshan Ranasinghe. The participating candidates pledged to carry out campaign activities in a peaceful manner. Meanwhile, Chairman of the Sri Lanka Podujana Peramuna, Professor GLP today said, Legal action will be taken on the rejection of the SLPP's nomination papers yesterday. Six of our nomination papers were rejected. We believe the rejection of some of them is not in accordance with the law. This will have no effect in our victory. Convening a media briefing, the joint opposition went on to allege that returning officers may have acted in a partition manner. I categorically reject the claim that their nomination papers were flawless. Our nomination papers had minor spelling errors and shortcomings with female representation. However, in five of their nomination papers in the Kalutara district, Kabir Hashim was written under the heading, Name of the Party. It's a grave error.
The UNP wanted to save their nomination, so they smoothly excused themselves. We will decide whether partisanship occurred or not during the court proceedings. Commenting on the rejection of six SLPP nominations, Minister of Provincial Councils and Local Government had this to say during a media briefing. I believe that when an election is around the corner, a court injunction is extremely unlikely. Meanwhile, various views were voiced on the upcoming elections across the political arena. A new journey has begun with Prime Minister Rani Wickremesinghe and President Maitripala Sirisena. We request the people's mandate to continue this clean governance. I believe Basil assumes our defeat will bring him victory and the former president assumes it will pave the way for his son to take over in 2025. The Janathabi Mukti Peramuna meanwhile elaborated on ambitious plans to stabilize the economy. Many people think the JVP's economic policies are destructive to the private sector. They are not. We have a vision of how the economy should be developed. In line with that vision, the economy can be brought forward only with the support from both state and private sectors. Our job will be to coordinate that support systematically. We won't pressure you as to what business you must undertake. However, we will formulate strategies to attract people towards business the government wants. Your profit may be less, but will be stable. In news making headlines across the country today, parliamentarian Shriyani Vijayvikrama from Digamadulla district was sworn in as the state minister of provincial councils and local government. She was sworn in by President Maitripala Sirisena today. Parliamentarian Shriyani Vijayvikrama was sworn in at the presidential secretariat where the minister of provincial councils and local government Faisal Mustafa was present. The Digamadulla District Parliamentarian Shriyani Vijay Vikrama, who represented the joint opposition recently, met with President Maitripala Sirisena to extend her support to the President. Following their meeting, she pledged her allegiance to the President and his policies. Meanwhile, Parliamentarian Dinesh Gunawardana says that the joint opposition will take necessary action against the now State Minister Shriyani Vijay Vikrama. In other stories, concluding a 12-day visit to Sri Lanka, the United Nations Working Group on Arbitrary Detention states that Sri Lanka should immediately implement reforms to end arbitrary detention. They also raise concerns over excessive and unjustified delays of court proceedings, adding that the right to the presumption of innocence and the due process have not been fully recognized. They made these remarks at a media briefing held in Colombo today. During the visit, we have recognised a number of positive initiatives on the part of the Government of Sri Lanka, including its engagement with UN human rights mechanisms, as well as the recent accession to the optional protocol to the Convention Against Torture. However, more action is required to give effect to Sri Lanka's obligations under international human law rights law, as well as to the commitments made by the Government under its Human Rights National Action Plan 2017 to 2021. In particular, we found that the right to personal liberty has has yet to be respected by law enforcement, security forces, judicial and other authorities. In particular, we found that there's an urgent need for reform to address problems including the excessive use of remand and pretrial detention, a lack of effective alternatives to detention, an outdated legal framework and reliance on confessions often extracted under torture, duress or coercion. Court proceedings are affected by excessive and unjust unjustified delays while suspects remain in detention indefinitely. The presumption of innocence and due process are yet to be fully recognised across Sri Lanka. We also learned about the uh, special laws and powers enacted during the state of emergency, and in particular the working group urges the government of Sri Lanka to repeal the Prevention of Terrorism Act 1979 as one of the key enablers of arbitrary detention for over four decades in this country. We also found that detainees in general do not enjoy some of the most fundamental guarantees of due process, such as immediate access to legal assistance from the moment of arrest and before an initial statement is made by suspects. We find this to be of great concern and is particularly occurring at police stations. During our visit, we also concentrated on uh, other situations of deprivation of liberty, particularly people in situations of vulnerability, such as women, children, elderly people, people living with 
psychosocial disabilities and those living in poverty. Despite identifying positive practices in this regard, we are concerned that a clear legal basis uh, and procedures for de depriving people of their liberty have not yet been clearly established. We also found that there are no effective safeguards against arbitrariness in this context and that there's an urgent need to strengthen mechanisms for independent monitoring and oversight. With regards to the National Police Commission, uh, we uh, met with them and we received information on the complaints that they, they received. What we found out is that those mechanisms to, to address complaints by police uh, abuse should be strengthened. They seem to have the necessity to have clearer procedures in which persons that present the complaints are informed and that the results uh, might lead to successful punishment to, to those who claim to be abused. We indeed visited the military base. We had free access to all places uh, within the compound. With regard to the National Human Rights Commission report, we are aware of the report. We are aware that they have complaints on arbitrary detention abuses, but we did not receive the detailed information about what's in those uh, 209 complaints. It's not within our mandate to deal with individual cases through country visits. We can receive through a regular procedure complaints about arbitrary detention. Uh, I have a question on uh, the Joseph Camp. Uh, you said that you got uh, free access uh, within the military process. What was the impression uh, of the place and uh, did you see any signs to suggest that, uh, that the process has been used as a detention centre? We visited the, the premises and we received information that that place has not been used for, for detention of civilians for a long, long time. We visited uh, three cells, but we were informed that those cells are used for military temporary detentions so that they can uh, address issues related to disciplinary measures. We did not see anything out of order in the premises and the buildings that we visited. We heard uh, many stories of people people who had been detained in pretrial detention for extensive periods of time. We heard uh, people that had not had access to lawyers during that pretrial detention and in fact during the trial and appeal period. We heard stories of people uh, who had been coerced to make statements at, at different um, periods of time as well. What we heard from persons deprived of liberty were not exclusively and necessarily uh, negative things about the system, but uh, we heard, of course, negative things about the system. We heard v v various things that are of our concern. There is uh, a challenge in the country to have a systematic legal representation for all persons that are deprived of liberty. One of the main findings that, that you will see in our preliminary findings is that uh, from the prisons that we visited, most of them are overcrowded. So that, that, that is a, a, an issue of course for the working group, the overcrowding of prison uh, facilities. Meanwhile, the United Nations Working Group today refused the complaint of the daughter of former Navy spokesperson Commodore DKP Dasnaika, who has been remanded in connection with aiding and abating the abduction and disappearance of 11 youths in 2008 and 9. This Anaika's daughter attempted to hand over the complaint to the UN Working Group at their media conference on arbitrary detention held at the BMICH today. I'm Kamala Dasnaika's daughter. I came here to uh, hand over a complaint regarding my father and Commander Sumitrana Singha because uh, they are also arbitrary detainees and these special delegates came to Sri Lanka to investigate about arbitrary detainees and they were in the country for 11 days and they actually attended to all LTT people but not war heroes. My father fought for country without looking for religion and races so I don't know why they didn't spare like five minutes to come to prison hospital and attend to military heroes who are kept in prison. He's been in jail for five months and still up to date he's not been charged. My father was arrested without the consent of the Honorable Attorney General Courts and uh, by using the powers vested on them as a investigation officers by CID and arrest was made without any cred credible evidence against him and CID is not prepared to consent for bail 
being granted to my father and especially the first suspect of this case is out with bail. The committee is still inside, they are not letting us in to hand over because we really need to give this to the committee because we want them to spare at least five minutes on us. I came here especially to make a complaint to UN. My father is a public figure and he has a good name and still he's not been charged. It's just that they are keeping him inside for no reason. They have still not provided his 2015 statement also to the courts. Foreign Minister Mangala Samaravira addressed the UN Human Rights Council on 3rd March 2017 and Commander Rana Singh and other leading seamen were arrested by CID on 2nd March 2017, just one day prior. Again on uh, UN Special Envoy, Mr. Ben Emerson comes to visit Sri Lanka on 4th to 15th July 2017 and Commodore Dasanayaka was arrested on 12th July. And then after they've been arrested, their court hearing and bail, actually bail consideration was postponed like four times related to these uh, other visits of UN. Prime Minister Rani Wickremesinghe says that the government has decided to provide a number of essential goods for concessionary prices until the upcoming Sinhala and Tamil New Year. He has said this at a function held in Gampaha this morning. The Gampaha bus stand, which was developed using 140 million rupees, was declared open to the public by Prime Minister Rani Wickremesinghe this morning. <laughs> State funds should be spent for requirements and needs of people, not the expectations of certain individuals. When I say cost of living, I see from the faces that the prices of goods have rapidly increased. As a solution for this issue, we have decided to provide a number of essential goods for concessionary price until the April New Year. The price of rice, coconut and vegetables is high now. The president met the subcommittee of cost of living and I met him on Tuesday and held discussions. Then we decided that the prices of rice, dal, sugar, potatoes, onions, sprats and makara should be reduced. In the meantime, Prime Minister Ranil Vikramasinghe gave directions to the Vice-Chancellors of all universities to upgrade the quality of higher education instead of prioritising the construction of university buildings. The Prime Minister pointed out that the international status gained by local universities has dropped at present and it is the duty of all Vice-Chancellors to ensure that education in universities is raised once more to international standards. The Premier made these observations at a meeting held at Temple Trees attended by Minister of Higher Education and Highways Lakshman Kiriyalla and Vice-Chancellors of Universities last morning. The PM also said that immediate steps should be taken to put an end to ragging in the university system and to create a healthy atmosphere for students to engage in academics successfully without any hindrance, even if it requires the recruitment of additional staff. Meanwhile, Prime Minister Ranil Vikramasinghe and Deputy Minister of International Coordination Department of Chinese Communist Party, Echi Wang Yajun, held a special meeting at Temple Trees yesterday. Minister of Sustainable Development and Wildlife, Gamini Javikrama Pereira, says that information of a racket of sending wild elephants using trawlers to Middle Eastern countries has been uncovered. The minister made these revelations in an interview with First at Nine. I had to make a strong request to the Honorable Sagar Ratnayaka to inquire into the CID because it's all interlinking. I reached up in the cabinet. The cabinet, Honorable Sagar Ratnayaka also admitted and said there's strong inf information that these elephants are captured and uh, taken into a trawler, transported to Middle East. We hear about $500,000 or so $1 million even. They have the money in Middle East shakes. So, uh, Honorable Sagar Ratnayaka admitted in the cabinet also said that they are also inquiring. There's a possibility that they also had come to know. So, we are given to them to inquire this. So, there is some conspiracy, we feel. Never tuskers like that, short period, four were killed also. One was poisoned, other three was killed, shot and killed also. Tuskers. One possibility is that planned systematically, the cases are coming now. AGT department filing cases on illegal elephants kept by the people. So, we can't control because our staff is limited and we have no right to go inside the forest department and our Mahaveli and inquire or like that. So I told the complaint, gave a letter to the cabinet and said we are the relevant authority organization, say Mahaveli area. With the Mahaveli officers, that area, we have camps, say commandos, STF, Army, Navy, Air Force. Today signed a cabinet paper for the next week that it will be taken up and we are, as a policy, it will be a national plan, car up all the forest areas with the institutions that this program will be implemented. So we have to discipline our people, officers, wildlife officers. You are watching.
Sri Lanka's number one news channel, Other Dharana 24-7. Welcome back everyone. Let's move on to business news now. Sri Lanka has entered into a three loan agreements worth 270 million US dollars with the Asian Development Bank for the implementation of two projects, an integrated road investment program and the Jaffna Kilinochi water supply project. A loan of 150 million US dollars was obtained for the investment required for the fourth tranche of the integrated road investment program and two loans worth 120 million US dollars were obtained as additional financing for the investment required for the ongoing Jaffna Kilinochi water supply project. The total investment cost of the overall program is 906 million US dollars of which 800 million US dollars will be provided by the Asian Development Bank under multi-tranche financing facility through six tranches. A central bank of Sri Lanka advises and requests the general public to refrain from mutilating, making alterations or defacing Sri Lanka currency notes. It also advises the public to exchange such currency notes available at hand with the nearest branch of licensed commercial banks on or before 31st of this month. Issuing a communique today, the central bank notifies that a clean note policy has been introduced by the central bank aiming at maintaining the quality standards of the currency notes and thereby helping to distinguish between genuine notes and counterfeits. Through this policy, it is also expected to enhance the image of the country and promote the efficiency of the process of currency notes. The communique goes on to say that holders of these currency notes will have to suffer the loss of face value of such notes. The central bank, however, informs the general public that currency notes that are not really fully mutilated, altered or defaced by but damage due to normal wear and tear during circulation can continue to be exchanged at the central bank and licensed commercial banks as it's the current practice. Dialog Asiata and Richard Perez ha and company have entered the latest composition of the S&P SL20 index of the Colombo Stock Exchange as part of the semi-annual rebalancing practice. The two stocks will replace Haley's and Melstra Corp effective from Monday the 18th of December. The S&P SL20 index tracks the top 20 largest and most liquid stocks. The S&P SL20 index has been designed in accordance with international practices and standards and all stocks are classified according to the Global Industrial Classification Standard, which was co-developed co by S&P and Dow Jones indices. Let's take you to the stock market now. Sri Lankan shares slipped to their lowest close in eight months today as investors offload telecom and plantation stocks. The Colombo stock index ended 0.08% weaker at 6,352.10. It dropped 0.4% this week in its sixth consecutive weekly decline. Now let's cross over to Imeshi Fernando from the Colombo Stock Exchange for a detailed report. The turnover was 345.41 million rupees with 16.6 million shares change in hands in 2,218 trades. Today's foreign purchases were 194.01 million rupees and foreign sales were 13.93 million rupees. There were three crossings today and the crossing turnover was 224.04 million rupees. Well, let's have a look at how the markets performed during the week. For that, let's uh, cross over to the month of Matthews from First Capital Holdings. The uh, market was on an overall uh, downtrend during the current week with some uh, strong selling pressure, especially on the foreign side. Uh, amidst the upcoming uh, festive season, we expect uh, a complete slowdown in the market activity with low level of uh, turnover and volume.
On to international news now. EU leaders have agreed to move Brexit talks onto the second phase but called for further clarity from the UK about its future intentions. Talks will now move on to the long-term relationship between the UK and EU. On the second day of a summit in Brussels, EU leaders decided there was sufficient progress made after a deal on citizens' rights, the Irish border and Britain's outstanding payments, giving negotiators a mandate to move on to the main phase of talks. The first issue to be discussed at talks next month will be the terms of an expected two-year transition phase after the UK's exit in March 2019. Meanwhile, earlier in the day, EU leaders arriving for the summit were optimistic in their views expressed to media. Today we will give the mandate for preparation for Commission and ourselves the mandate for negotiation for the future of our relations and this probably will start in March. Are we definitely moving to the second stage? Absolutely, definitely. Obviously we're concerned at some developments in, in London, um, but we are totally committed from our side to deliver as soon as possible. Prime Minister Shinzo Abe's top government spokesman said today that Japan will be imposing additional sanctions on North Korea following repeated threats by Pyongyang's missiles and nuclear program. North Korea launched a missile that landed in Japan's exclusive economic zone last month, which was widely condemned by global powers. Japan's chief cabinet secretary Yoshihide Suga told a news conference that Japan would freeze assets of 19 more North Korean institutions, a decision made during a cabinet meeting today. North Korea fired missiles over Japan as it pursues nuclear weapons and ballistic missiles in defiance of UN sanctions and international condemnation. On the 29th of November, it has fired an intercontinental ballistic missile, which it said was its most advanced yet, capable of reaching the mainland, United States. Also in international news, a report on child abuse in Australia recommends that the country should introduce a law forcing religious leaders to report child abuse, including Catholic priests who are told of abuse in the confessional. The 17-volume document from the Royal Commission into Institutional Response to Child Abuse delivered to Australian Governor-General today marks the end of one of the world's biggest inquiries into child abuse. The five-year investigation found multiple and persistent failings of institutions to keep children safe, the cultures of secrecy and cover-up, and the devastating effects child sexual abuse can have on an individual's life. The inquiry heard previously that the Australian Catholic Church paid $212 million US dollars in compensation to thousands of child abuse victims since 1980. What that commission has done has been exposed a national tragedy. It's an outstanding exercise in love and I thank the commissioners and those who had the courage to tell their stories. I think whatever the cost, we have to address this fully. Uh, we have to be uh, ready to give whatever it takes to bring healing and justice and compassion to the victims. And of course, the churches have already been doing this for some time now. There's been processes in place and there's been court judgments and so on. Uh, and we know there'll be more of that ahead. And I say that we stand ready uh, to do what is just and compassionate in this area. You are watching Sri Lanka's premier news channel, Other Dharana 24-7. On to sports now, Sri Lanka Cricket today announced the squad of 15 players selected to play the three-match 2020 series against India from the 20th to the 24th of December. The team led by Tisara Pereira consists of Upul Saranga, Angelo Matthews, Kusal Janit Pereira, Danushk Gunatilaka, Niroshan Dikvala, Asela Gunaratna, Sadira Samravikrama, Dasun Shanaka, Chaturanga De Silva, Sachit Pathirana, Akila Dananja, Dushmant Chamira, Nuan Pradeep and Vishwa Fernando. However, Lasit Malinga has been rested. Well, Russian President Vladimir Putin says that Russia's former anti-doping chief turned whistleblower Gregory Rudchenkov is working under the control of U.S. Special Services. A scandal over the 2014 Sochi Olympics triggered by revelations made by Rudchenkov is part of a broader doping affair that has led to the suspension of Russia's anti-doping agency Rusta, the country's athlete, federation and Paralympic committee. 
Putin also said during his year-end news conference that the doping scandal has been fueled deliberately before Russia's presidential election due in March next year. He also said that both global anti-doping body WADA and the International Olympic Committee were working under duress. First of all, who said that he is an honest person? He was on trial and it is known he was cheating. And he has been saying in many occasions that money matters the most for him. Second, he is under the FBI's control and protection. This is not an advantage for us. It's a disadvantage. It means that he works under the control of the American Special Services. What are they doing with him? What drugs do they give him to make him say what they want to hear? It is just laughable. And third, all of it is in his diaries. So what? You are watching Sri Lanka's trusted news brand. Other than a 24 7. Good evening and welcome to the Weather Center. Now, the western region of the country, especially north of Colombo, is likely to soar in temperatures with 31 degrees Celsius likely at some stage. Now, the coastal areas around the country, of course, will max out in the high 20s, with central hills likely to remain as cool. As always, of course. Now, as the day progresses, tomorrow rains are likely in the central, western and southern provinces, especially in the afternoon and early evening. If you are thinking of spending some time at the beach down south with the family, especially during the school holidays, it may not necessarily be a picture book scenario. Up next is your City by City forecast. Watching Sri Lanka's award winning news channel, Other Verena 24 7. Well, as it is Friday, let's send this working week on a high note. Time for your good story of the week. Tonight's story comes to us from Dallas, Texas, US. A high school student, Ariana Luterman, was finishing the ankle leg of a girls' relay in the Dallas Marathon when she saw the legs of the women's marathon leader, Dr. Chandler Self, start to buckle from exhaustion yards from the finishing line. Acting instinctively, Luterman helped Dr. Herself to her feet and half carried her to the finish line, giving the New York City Psychiatric the Women's Championship. Dr. Self's family later told uh, that she had been credited with the win, adding that Luteman came alongside her two miles from the finish line and encouraged her to finish the race. That is a part of your world tonight right here on Other Than Earth 24-7. Indi Amartha will return tomorrow first at 9. Be sure to join her then. When you have the time, make sure you connect with us on Facebook. For that, go to facebook.com slash first at 9 or on Twitter at twitter.com first at 9. I'm Mahesh Johnny. Enjoy the weekend. Good night.